Welcome to The Supernatural with Laura Maxwell on Eternal Radio. In these programs, we will hear the true supernatural accounts from those who try various spiritualities. You shall tell the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Today's guest is Kim Morgan, and she is from across the pond in Oregon. And her, her testimony, I feel, is kind of a, appropriate for this time of year, the Halloween season, um, simply because of some of the things she shares, and in particular um, about a spirit that appeared looking like a clown. Um so we like to try to, to, to give testimonies at this time of year um, that are kind of in theme with Halloween. In the past, I've had ex-Satanists, ex-witches um, and so on. So I thought this was kind of a, appropriate. And um, she has some really interesting things to say as well. So let's go across and say hello to Kim Morgan. Hello, Kim. Good morning, Laura. How are you? I'm fine. How Doing are you? well. It's early morning here. I know it's late where you are. Yeah, it's just about dinner time here, so it's not too late. Um, and it's good to, to finally speak to you. So it was interesting because you said that you'd saw me on YouTube. Um, and like quite a few of my guests, often they will tell me that they'd saw me on YouTube or TV over the years. So it's lovely to connect with people. Um, I feel we have that connection. Well, I feel I know you already, although you don't know me at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think we met on um, the Facebook page. Stephen Bancars. Stephen Ban Bancars. Yeah, what an awesome testimony he has. And, of course, you um, said that you would saw Johanna Michelson as well. Um, that had inspired you, and she was someone that inspired me in the beginning, so just a lovely connection there. Yeah, one of the first to come forward. Yeah, hers is very good. Joanna? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Awesome, really, really good. Um, so, Kim, really just jump into it then and, and tell us a little of your family background. Did any of your parents have an interest in spiritual things? How did you um, begin to have an interest well, you know, I had absolute—I had very little grounding in in anything spiritual. Um, I consider myself just a product of the 1960s, where I came from a, a broken family. Um, I was one of the last of the baby boomers. Um, my mother and father separated when I was one, and my father just never looked back. So I had a single working mother, and, you know, our life was kind of austere. I was what they called at the time a latchkey kid. So mm -hmm. I left, you know, I woke up, my mother left for work. When I returned home from school, I, I, it was an empty house. Oh, my little dogs. Uh, I came home to an empty house, and uh, my mother would be so tired after work, you know, I, I'd make my own TV dinner. So there's really no home life, no family life, and and no uh, spiritual foundation set. I was just kind of left on my own. And I had never been baptized. Although my mother had, and everyone else in my family had, she wanted to leave it to me to decide. So that was kind of common in the 1960s. And um, so I would say that what happened to me, was television became my best friend and was my babysitter and unfortunately most of my role models I found on television and uh, that really uh, confused me I mean you know the people back in the say the late 1960s when I was growing up that were admired the most were say Marilyn Monroe who had been gone then for maybe seven eight years but I would see documentaries about her yeah. and you know her, here was a tragic person 
who um, was self-destructive and, uh, you know, it just led me to believe that in order to matter in life, you had to be tragic. <laughs> That uh, that beauty was what you wanted, fame, riches. So, you know, being an only child in an empty apartment most of the time, I kind of lived in a fantasy world a lot. And I uh, dreamed of the day I'd be free and I'd be out on my own and I was going to set the world on fire. Uh, I really didn't know how I was going to do that, but... Um, that was my dream. That was the world I lived in as a child. But I did have, and I remember to this day, I had a praying grandmother. So my grandmother um, was born in 1900 and was a very simple person. I saw her kneel down by the side of her bed and pray every night. Mm -hmm. And I have a strong feeling that she was praying for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that's why the Lord never, you know, let me f fall completely into the, the abyss. Maybe that's why he came to my rescue so many times. But, uh, yeah, that would have been kind of my childhood. Um, I don't think my father had any faith. Uh, my mother, to this day, I'm trying to get her to embrace salvation she's now 81 and she thinks because she's a good person that that's going to be enough and yeah and i i you know that's my prayer every night is that you know event that it'll penetrate that she'll see in some way she'll have that road to damascus experience where mm. you know mm. she knows she needs somebody and that's On so the common, other. isn't it, Kim? It's so common, you know, most people, I think, probably feel, well, if there's a heaven and hell, I'll probably go to heaven because I'm quite a good person. Mm -hmm. um, they just don't realise it's got nothing to do with how good you are or how bad you are. It's about we all need forgiven and washed clean by the blood of Jesus to yep. get to heaven. I hear that over and over again, yep. all my friends, you know. Well, the Lord knows my heart. He knows I'm a good person, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like, well, you know, that's, that's a faith of your own invention, that you get to be whoever you want to be, and the Lord will uh, adjust to that, and you, you're going to get into, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to move through the system in the direction uh, you think you should go. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It's not about him knowing you, it's about you knowing him. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, by the time I did get out of that prison I called my childhood, um, you know, what did I do? I mean, I just self-destructed. I was, uh, I was like a loose horse. Um, I got into drugs, uh, gambling, smoking. I was swearing, uh, lying, cheating, uh, just very morally loose. Because I thought that, you know, to have morals was, I don't know, the connotation there was, you know, it was just so confining. Um, I just wasn't going to be restricted by morals. And I didn't know how to get what it was I wanted, you know, which was, you know, I wanted a lot of creature comforts. I wanted success. I wanted money. I wanted all of the things that other people with low self-esteem dream of, right? Yeah. So by the time I was about early 20s, I would say I I was just ran myself into a frazzle. Um, now we're talking about the 1970s. And this this had to be one of the loosest periods of time. Um, this was the days of disco and Studio 54. And, uh, you know, even the, the movie stars. Elizabeth Taylor was in Betty uh, Ford Rehab. Um, yeah. They were doing cocaine at the tables in front of you. Uh -huh. You know? Yeah. So, you know, I'm coming of age. I'm I'm 
in this mess. And, you know, as unique as I thought I was, I was not unique at all. I was just part of this, which, you know, nowadays I would tell you it's, it was social engineering right, at its finest. But, uh, yeah, well, what was the end result? You know, you know I, I um, okay, so if I can switch to the spiritual aspects of it all. Mm -hmm. The first thing I remember, uh, I remember an angel coming to my rescue once before this. But I had a dream that was so profound to me that it stuck with me all my life. So I would say at the age of 12 or 13 years old, I have the following dream. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was crossing a very rickety, narrow footbridge. It was very worn and rickety and old. And I was crossing a body of water that looked like a river in order to get to the other side. And on the other side, I could see a beautiful green valley with, it, with mountains and blue skies. And in the center of that green valley, there was this cluster of trees where I knew that there was a home somewhere in that little cluster of trees that I couldn't see. But that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to cross this blue body of water, and I wanted to get to that home. But when I looked down into the water, there was a devil, and he was swimming around and darting around, and he was doing everything he could to distract me and get me to fall off of that narrow footbridge. And so, mm -hmm. and so then I did fall off that narrow footbridge. I fell into the water, and when I looked behind me, he was swimming furiously toward me, and I was swimming furiously towards shore. And then that, that's where the dream ended. And I've thought about that dream many times because of the age I was. But I'll tell you, it just occurred to me as I was uh, thinking through what we talk about today. That was about the age of accountability that I had that dream. Yeah, 12. Yeah, absolutely. 12 or 13. Yeah. And I think the Lord was telling me, you're, you know, you're in his clutches. You're in his grip now. You're in his uh -huh, territory. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that was the first time the Lord uh, gave me any kind of a message. And um, I think then later on, the next time I heard from him, I was in a drunken stupor. Um, I was about 23 years old. And I heard a voice very, very clearly say to me, uh, this will be the means of your death. And I had, I had, uh, that was like a Thanksgiving time, and I had drank a lot of vodka, which I was deathly allergic to, and didn't know it. And I'm telling you, I was so ill. But it was a warning I appreciated. You know, I didn't heed it naturally, but I appreciated it. So, so at this time, I'm... We're talking about my early 20s. I'm working in a casino in poker rooms. Uh, I, had, I had earlier, this is how I got my start in life. I was a six foot tall blonde in the early 70s. Um, the first job I ever had was working in the winner's circle at Santa Anita. So, which was surreal because I was the winner's circle girl for a short period of time. And here I was meeting movie stars and mm -hmm. presenting trophy no, not presenting trophies but getting people to uh, agree to donate a portion of their purse that they just won to this uh, no this anti-dog racing initiative so I mean this was heady stuff for me and you know I'm uh, it shouldn't have happened I'm sorry it ever did happen it gave me a very unrealistic view of the world but because of that I wound up at the modeling agency in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Or no, it was in Hollywood. It was Pasadena at the Bill Adrian Modeling Agency as a 17 or 18-year-old. And I could see immediately that this, this, was, uh, this was a bad thing. 
that the man that was running this teen modeling agency was a pedophile. I heard him, I overheard him speaking on the phone to the mother of one of the young teens and he was threatening her and he told her um, that if he, she didn't allow the daughter to accompany him down to the bullfights in Tijuana that weekend, then she was just standing in the daughter's way and didn't want the daughter to succeed. So, which, again, you know, the Lord protects me because uh, it was day one, so I just never called him back. I never went back to that place. But that... Yeah. That told me that all of this Hollywood stuff, what, what it really was, it was very dark and it was very, there was an underbelly to it that, you know, mm. was very difficult. So I'm working in the casinos and here is Hal. Hal's in his 50s. Um, my mother comes to see me in the casino. She and Hal meet and they form a five-year-long relationship. Hal was a Jewish man who, probably the best thing that ever happened to us. You know, he loved me. He loved my mother. He was generous. He was kind. He was fun. But uh, right around the fourth year, uh, Hal um, became ill, and it turned out to be lung cancer. So I went to visit him in the hospital a few times, and he was dying. And uh, for those of you that don't, no, don't do chemo, don't do radiation, just don't do it. But in on the final day, uh, I went to see him, and I sat with him in the hospital room. Um, I was holding his hand when he died. I was actually taking his pulse, and uh, mm -hmm. at first his pulse raced, and a tear, I saw a tear form at the corner of his eye, and he was in a coma at that time, and uh, mm -hmm. then... Mm -hmm. his pulse just stopped and there was nothing so I remember looking up above to the ceiling to see if I could see anything and I and I really didn't see anything but I was sure that at that time your spirit you know departed and it was nearby mm -hmm. two weeks later two weeks later a lucid dream Hal and I are sitting in a white room and I'm looking down, and he's holding my hand, and uh, I say to him, Hal, I looked for you, but I didn't see you leave. And he said, no, but he stayed with his body until they put it in the hertz. And I said, oh, and I said, well, where are you now? He said, I'm with Jesus. And I said, really? You're with Jesus? Because Hal had, was Jewish, and I never, in my, I never heard him mention Jesus. Yeah. I said, you're with, you're with Jesus? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what's he like? Hal said, he's a very good manager. He said, he's very, good well, we work in a casino, so the boss was, the, yeah, he's yeah. a very good manager. <laughs> he said, but he's very busy now. He's getting ready to come down there. And so, at that point, I looked up into his face, and what I saw were two eyes that were marbly and glassy, and they did not look like Hal's eyes at all. And the thought went through my mind, you didn't go to heaven. You know, you went so. But, and I became frightened. So the minute I became frightened, the image vanished. And then I could see that in an adjoining room, he was in there consoling my mom. But, you know, that led me to believe that, you know, all roads led to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that, that was very confusing. Although it did also led me to believe that, that Jesus was returning. I didn't know what to make of that until I met a woman, this Mary Griffith. She had been with her husband at the moment of death, and she had an exact, a very similar encounter. 
where she woke up in the middle of the night, two weeks after he died, and he was standing in the door doorway. And she said he, her husband was now young, and he looked like he did when she first met him, and he was glowing, and his arms were reaching out towards her. And uh, that's my dog. Can you hear that? Mitchie, quit it! And, um, uh, but when she looked up into his eyes, they were so diabolical looking that it frightened her, and she ran to the bedroom and woke up. Now, she didn't know whether that was a dream or had really happened. That's how realistic. Mm -hmm. stick it it was but there we compared notes right mm -hmm. and we said oh well this is what happens two weeks after yeah, someone dies they come back to you to console you <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so let's see so that was Hal and then uh, my ex-husband Jerry and this is when synchronicities really start to ke kick in again it's a dream where I'm standing at the altar to marry someone else. And can you, Kim, could you explain that, please? Not everyone may have heard of the term synchronicities. I do because when I was into New Age, I believed in that kind of thing too. But can you just give a definition of that, please? Well, I mean, the, the secular world knows them as coincidences. Mm -hmm. But they happen mm -hmm. at a frequency and they happen in such a timely way that... You, you know that uh, something and someone is interacting with you, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that with Jerry, that's what it was. I had had a crush on Jerry years before, and he jilted me. And now it's five years later, and I haven't seen him. And the dream is I'm standing at the altar to marry someone who was like a hobo or something. And someone grabs my arm from behind and when I turn around, there he is, Jerry. Jerry's did that. So I thought, well, that was interesting. But, you know, within a month, I run into Jerry. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a changed person. And I can tell you that when... Um, now, okay, so I'm going to reveal this part. What we had in common were our demons. And I do believe that my demons and his demons were... We're attracted to one another because... Sure. I know what you're saying. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, at that. the time I thought the universe was pushing us together. Mm. But sure. uh, the fruit of it was, you know, he was a professional gambler. What did we do? We drank, we smoked, we, you know, we, we lived this life. He was insecure. Um, just life in the fast track. So... The very first year was heaven. Everything was wonderful. He loved me. Everything I did was perfect in his eyes. Second year, we got married. It was real. Now we were having, you know, troubling times, and then we would make up, and, you know, but probably normal. But the third year was absolute hell. Everything I did, he was suspicious of. Um... You know, I'm sure, and I'm sure I did my part in that, too. Um, I mean, we just could not work it out. We couldn't get along. Uh, insecurities, jealous. I mean, just so much terrible, destructive stuff that I had to leave. And, you know, good. that was a choice. I mean, that was really a fork in the road that I think the Lord... It was kind of put before me, you know, you have to choose to stay in this relationship, which is going to offer you, you know, lots of money and lots of uh, status and those kinds of things. Or you're going to go off on your own and you're going to try to have to figure it out, right? And you're going to lose your status and you're going to lose all of that stuff and you're going to start from scratch. But, you know, I just I just had to take the that, that road. I, I was just suffering. I mean, all my abandonment issues, everything. Everything. Yeah. He wanted to divorce every other day, and the silent treatment would go on for weeks at a time. I mean, it was just... So, that was a very, very painful period, but then all pain leads to change. And uh, so now we're looking at about 1990. 1990, there is no internet yet. Not really. Uh, there was Prodigy, America Online is just kicking in. 
this is the time where I'm divorced, I'm on my own, and I get interested in the JFK assassination. I go down the rabbit hole. And um, I think at that time also a woman tried to do a life regression on me through hypnosis. I found out that, you know, I couldn't be hypnotized at that time. Um, and and I begin to, to discover how much deception there really is in the world. And it's shocking to me. I mean, through, through the JFK assassination, I mean, I just can't believe how power was really wielded in this world. This is, I start getting my education. This is my real education in, in life is, uh, is becoming what is now known as a truther. You know, just seeing through this, this uh, what is it? It's, they call it, uh, what do they call it in that movie with Keanu? Who Reeves that I've never seen. The Matrix, right? The Matrix, yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, so one day, I'm dealing cards at the Bicycle Club in Los Angeles, and I can tell you it started in a single night. I, I sit down to shuffle up and deal Texas Hold'em, where you put three cards on the board that everyone will uh, play their hand with. And I flop three fours. And from probably 11 o'clock at night until exactly 4.44 in the morning, I put three fours on the board an incredible number of times. I mean, just mm -hmm. it defied all probability, all logic. Uh, the players were complaining. I was changing decks. I was doing everything I knew to do to randomize these cards. And yet... I would leave the table, go to the next table, sit down, shuffle up three fours again. And people, I mean, the players were saying, what's up, dealer? Why are you doing this? Well, <laughs> finally, after doing this for hours, you know, what do I know? I mean, the, it, I probably dealt a million hands of cards in my life, so this could happen. But uh, I go to a final table, I sit down, I shuffle up, boom, three fours on the board again. And I'm scratching my head. I turn to look at the digital clock. It's 4.44 in the morning. And I happen to look down and I'm on mm -hmm. table 44. I said, whoa, somebody's trying to tell me something here. Mm -hmm. But that, that's the night that the dam broke. And from that point on, everywhere I went, everything I did, if it was... Uh, if it was the license plate on a car, if it was the registration I was given, if it was an account number, a phone number, a receipt, always to, to I mean, to an incredible degree, there was a 444 incorporated in those numbers. Mm -hmm. So it started, and I mentioned it to a friend as we were going down the street, I said, you know, the strangest thing is happening to me. I'm seeing these four, four, fours everywhere I, I go. And he laughed and he said that that had happened to him too. And just as, as he said that, we passed the 444 to one club bar, which I didn't even know was there. Yeah. And I said, well, what, what does it mean? And he said, well, you know, he didn't know. So, I wasn't content with that. Watching a I remember having the same thing, actually, Kim. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. I remember having the same thing. And different, you know, explanations would be given by various New Agers. It, it's the number of a certain angel. It means this, it means that. Um, but, yeah, it all stopped when I became a Christian, which is interesting. But please continue. Well, I, I saw a psychic on a crime show. I was watching a crime show um, where they had, the psychic had helped them to uh, solve it. So I got her name, and now there's an internet, so I can search her out on the internet, which I did. And uh, I contacted her. I said that I wanted to do an over-the-phone consultation. She says, fine, just mail me something that belongs to you. So I did. 
And on the phone, uh, the first thing I brought up were, what are these fours all about? I mean, it's incredible. Now I'm waking up at precisely 4.44 in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just one incident after another, there's some, there's an intelligence behind this. You know, I just, I know that um, a car on a highway, a lonely highway, a, a white car is passing me. I'm doing 55. They're doing 75. They're passing me in the, in the next lane. But what do they do? They pull right in front of me, slow down. Their license plate is 444. And then they shoot off. Well, mm -hmm. who prompted them to do that? You know? So I asked her, and her explanation at the time that it was um, gematria and that it was rooted in the Bible and it had to do with end times. And she's telling me that I've been activated and that more will come now. And, um, you know, I used that. And then there was a woman who had an, uh, um, what, what was her name, Divine or something? She had a website where people were posting all of their 444 and 1111 experiences. And she claimed that they, they were angels reaching out, right? I think she's since changed her mind. I just yeah. read recently where she's uh, disavowed all of that. And uh, she worries that she misled people now mm -hmm. but uh so that's happening to me also another man i ran across this very attractive fellow uh his name was john the first time i saw laid eyes on this fellow john i i remember it exactly again our demons must have locked in on one another because sure. the familiar spirit that kept appearing to me as john mm -hmm. uh became a constant in my life I would I would chronicle the John dreams I was having. And, you know, he was snuggling up to me. I mean, they weren't overtly sexual, but they were very comforting. And this is someone that I didn't have any kind of relationship with in life. You know, he was younger than I was. and uh, But I would know, because he was a player in one of the casinos, I would know that he was there when I would drive up. If he walked in the door, I would look up to walk, watch him come through the doors. I would run into him every, mm -hmm. everywhere. And now I know what it was. But then I thought, oh, well, maybe we know each other from a previous life. You know? Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It, it, it always seems to be we think it's a good thing yeah. when these things happen. But it's only when we leave the New Age we realize, as you say, it was actually a demonic um, attraction or, or link going on there, but yeah, I believe that now. Continue. Well, now I have an encounter that really gets me. Um, because where is Jesus in all of this? Well, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the kind of person that goes to church on Christmas, I get all dressed up and I go. But the one thing that I'll say is every time I went to church, I was overcome. I mean. Tears would, would well up in my eyes, and I couldn't control them. It's not that I was sobbing. I wasn't yeah. sobbing. There was just this, this incredible flow of tears that was embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I wouldn't know what that was about. You know, I do now. I know it's the Holy Spirit. But then I just yeah. couldn't account for it. So I have this encounter with a, a, a person at another casino, Casino San Pablo. Now, anything can turn you around. Who knows? I'm hoping that for somebody it's my testimony today. But his testimony came out of the blue. And he was a security guard. And as best I can recall what he said that day, I was on break, killing time, talking to the security guard. And he was telling me about himself. He had been, uh, he was from a South Pacific country where he had been very high up in the military, been like a colonel in the military. His brother-in-law had been very high up in politics. If I can remember right, his, his brother-in-law had been the dictator of this little country. And he told me, he says, you know, I, I had a lot of power then. He said, I didn't have the kind of power where if you were in prison, I could get you out. But if you wanted to get your kid into the university, I could get that done for you. 
And and he said, well, then his brother-in-law was deposed, and he had to flee that country overnight. Packed up his sons, his wife, and landed in the United States, where now he's employed as a security guard. And I asked him, I said, well, how does anybody cope with that last lo loss of status? I mean, you're, you're this big shot. And now you come to this country, you're, you know, you're like a, a tree. People walk by you, they don't even notice you. It must be hard. And he said, well, it really was at first. He said, but then something happened. And I said, well, what happened? And, you know, they did what they always do. Or, he looks right, he looks left to make sure no one else can hear. And he tells me, he says, well, you weren't here at the time. But uh, about a year ago, I was standing here and I had a heart attack. And uh, the ambulance came and took me off down the street to the emergency room. He says, but that's not where I was. And, and he said, you want to know where I was? I said, where? He says, I was approaching a beautiful throne. I said, really? He says, yeah. He says, and there was a man sitting on that throne. I said, who was it? He said, it was Jesus Christ. I said, wait a minute. Whoa. Are you a Christian? He said, heck no, I'm a Buddhist. Oh. I said, well, what a minute. You're a Buddhist guy and you die and you see Jesus Christ? He said, that's right. I said, how did you know it was him? He said, I just knew. And so I said, well, what happened? He said, well, you know, there were two doors behind his throne. One led to the next world and one brought me back here and he gave me the choice. And I remember thinking at the time that I was, you know, had had like three or four sons in this new country that really needed me. And I, I thought, I want to come back and be there for them. He said, as soon as I thought it, boom, I was on the gurney in the emergency room. My eyes opened. And it was uh, just before that the attending physician was about to do an, a you break open his chest and do an open heart massage. And so, and it frightened that, I mean, the doctor just jumped back because that guy was gone at that moment and suddenly he was back. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's one thing to hear me on the radio. It's one thing to read it in a book. But when somebody looks you in the eye and tells you their testimony, you believe it. I, you know, he's got no reason to lie. He's not selling anything. So, that... And so did he, was he still a Buddhist? What, you know, in your opinion, was that the real Jesus Christ he spoke to? Or, um, well, if you know it by the fruit, know. here was a guy sure. who was now content with this situation. And right, I can't... So there was no change in his life. He didn't, this so-called Jesus didn't say he had to put his faith in him. Nothing like that, just a kind of, no. as you say, all roads lead to God, kind of a demonic lie. That I don't know. You know, that that I can't say. But I can say that what he did have was a peace and uh, an acceptance of his situation. And did he become a Christian? Um, well, I mean, logic tells me he did, but I don't know that he did. You know, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, there was no mention of hell or the path he'd been on. There was no accounting for any of that. So, yeah, that is confusing to me, too. Yeah. Well, yeah. so now I'm, you know, as fascinated as I was by JFK and by all these other, um, you know, deceptions that, uh, and hoaxes that uh, we... Uh, that shape us throughout our lives. Now I moved to Oregon, which is like ground zero for New Age. Let me tell you, they all all the writers live in Eugene. Mount Shasta is considered sacred, um, and I moved from San Francisco Bay Area to here, and I opened up a store, and it's a store that does very poorly, but uh, gives me. A lot of time to talk to customers and meet people and visit with people. Mm -hmm. And I meet more New Agers coming through my store. I meet a fellow, his last name was White. It wasn't Chris White, but 
uh, he was a fellow who had been regularly doing astral projection and had written some books that he was getting published. And in the store, he tells me, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, he knew it was possible. He was in college the first time it happened. He does it regularly every night. He's on the astral plane, you know. Jesus is no big deal. I mean, everybody thinks, Jesus is up there. He sees him. He's just kind of standing around. Um, and he encourages me to do it. It will really open me up. So I hear him talk about that. And also, a lot of people, you know, don't think for one second. I know you know this, Laura. But don't think for one second that, um, that the devil doesn't act. Uh, people to go and influence you without their knowing. I would have I would have customers bring me New Age books all the time. You know, I got that's how I got my hands on A Course in Miracles and The Shack and Conversations with God. And there was another book about manifesting what you wanted. I think Oprah Winfrey was behind that one. Um, because at the time, I in my downtime in the store I'm reading lots of OBE and near-death experience stories on the internet I'm fascinated by them and a lot of them now are about Jesus Christ so I'm beginning to turn that direction and the more I turn the more these people come in and offer me up all of this you know new age stuff um, but I did buy one I bought one myself that was uh, on astral projection and it was by Bruce Moen and it came to my house uh, from Amazon. Actually, my friend, I was reading everything but the Bible. I mean, <laughs> the only thing I didn't read was the Bible. <laughs> and of course, it would be the New Age interpretation of who Jesus was, which obviously is not the real Jesus. So although you were being attracted that way, it was just another diversion in a yep. sense. Yep. And when I did attend church, unfortunately, it was the Unity Church, and, and uh, uh, they took us through uh, uh, meditation, clearing our minds. Oh, so no. I went to, you know, who even knows this stuff? You go to a church, there's a cross on the front door, you think that, you know, you're in the right place, but you're not. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so once I got that book, something happened. And so I have a bookshelf that's over my head. When I sleep at night, uh, there's uh, the headboard of my bed is a bookshelf, and all of these books are lined up there. And um, I remember documenting in my diary that I'm feeling that like I'm vibrating at night. I, I now know it was a spirit husband, too, that was coming and visiting me. And to top it all off, I've been working so hard in the store six days a week with no vacation that one of my customers who's hooked on painkillers, she gives me a handful and she says, here, this is for, you know, your aching neck. So, boy, did that feel good. So now I've started taking these uh, painkillers whenever she gives me a few, and which were legal. She's getting them legally. Mm -hmm. So under those conditions... Here's what happens. And when you say spirit husband, do you mean, you know, the incubus succubus type phenomena where you were actually being, you know, sexually abused by? It didn't go that far. It was more, you know, I think I was being courted at that time. Mm -hmm. Because it was more arms around me, uh, you know, uh, but I wasn't being sexually attacked. No, I think it would have led to that. You know, uh -huh. if I'd have encouraged it. Um, mm -hmm. But so it was it was at this time that I had my first near out of body experience. And the, the day this happened, it must have been my one day off. I think it was a Sunday. It was my, my one day off about five o'clock, six o'clock at night. There's a an. A and E movie about the history of angels and angelic beings, who, who I believe in and um, I believe existed. So I'm watching this, but boy, I 
my eyes, I can hardly keep them open. I'm just suddenly so very, very tired. And I thought, well, gee, I really want to hear this, so I'll close my eyes and I'll just listen to to it. And as as I was doing that, what I had been reading about in that astral projection book began to manifest. I found myself in that state where the body's asleep but the mind's awake. And I began to feel a tingling in my outer extremities, my fingers and toes. And my mind kind of fixed on that because it was it was growing stronger. And as it grew stronger, it became a vibration. And it was moving up my legs and up my arms towards the center of me, towards my solar plexus. And as it was moving up towards the center of me, it was getting even stronger. So I'd say it became like a very strong buzz, like I was just gaining in vibration. And I began to feel myself lift very slightly and I in my mind I'm thinking oh I know what this is I'm about to have I'm about to astrally project I'm about to have an out-of-body experience this is great and so um and I thought I had lifted I opened my eyes but I I hadn't gone anywhere I was still there so I thought shoot and I I closed my eyes again and this process began again immediately but much quicker you know went from tingling to vibrating to buzzing very quickly and moved towards the center of me and then i'm feeling lift off and i know i'm rising but i keep my eyes closed i don't want to mess it up a second time mm -hmm. suddenly i feel two very gentle hands come down on my ankles and my shoulders and push me back down into my body and my eyes are still closed and I'm and I'm thinking to myself why are you stopping me well, why can't I do this you know why why am I not allowed to do this mm -hmm. and then I fell into a very very deep sleep and I was kind of like in this Morticia Adams uh, position all night long just flat on my back with my arms across across my chest and that night I have this, you know, really horrid dream where somebody sitting right next to me is talking to me. They're telling me that uh, an angel is, is coming to visit me the next day. And this angel will have many wings. And, and um, I look over to see who's telling me this. And there's this clown face looking at me I mean just hideous clown he doesn't even look and he's got these mm. eyes that are very mocking and again I use the word diabolical looking they look like marbles they're glassy and creepy yeah. and uh, and you know I was I was worried about this guy but I don't remember how that dream ended I just remember that in the morning, I'm laying in the same position, and I feel the bed moving. My little dog is now getting up and moving around, so that wakes me. And I open my eyes. And when I open my eyes, there is a black shadow walking past the foot of my bed from left to right. And... I'll describe him, you know, he looks like a cartoon. He's thin and has long limbs. And when he's uh, tippy-toeing, like he's trying to be quiet, as he's tippy-toeing, he's lifting his legs up very high and he's tippy-toeing past in an exaggerated fashion. Well, <laughs> as oh soon as... <laughs> and that was meant to be an angel? <gasps> Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's what, yeah, but uh, believe me, I'm still, I'm still really dumb at this point. I don't know what I'm dealing <laughs> with at all, because, but the minute my eye, I set my eyes on him, he spins around suddenly. He knew it. He knew I had looked at him. He spins towards me. I see no features. He's completely black, and he dart down into the floor, 
And I don't know where he went because it was, you know, he was at the foot of my bed. So I don't know if he's under my bed mm -hmm. or he went through the floor. I don't know where he went. But I'm so stupid that I, I, I remember saying, oh, little spirit, you're welcome here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Don't be afraid. <laughs> oh, oh, I know. I'm telling you. Uh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's, when, uh, that's where, where the beginning of the uh, paralysis, sleep paralysis begins. And from that point on, mm -hmm. um, I'm attacked now. And always between the hours of 12 and 3. I mean, even last night I was awakened between the hours of 12 and 3. They call that the witching hour. I guess there's less act spiritual activity, so it's a better, more optimal time for them to attack. And um, they would, I would be laying in bed sleeping, and I would feel this suddenly this pulling sensation on my body. Um, my muscles were pulling uh, it it kind of felt to me like whatever it was was trying to gain entry inside of me mm -hmm. um and in my mind i couldn't couldn't move my mouth but in my mind i would i would rebuke them in jesus name i would say i belong to jesus you must go and i don't even know how i knew to do that but mm -hmm. uh some part of me did, and that would bring it to an end. Very slowly, I would begin to, like, thaw out. Mm -hmm. Well, about the third time that happened... And yet you didn't even know Jesus at this point. It's an acquaintance. He's an acquaintance. He's not a mm -hmm. friend. He knows me, but I don't know him. You know, it's terrible. Sure. Um, uh -huh. But uh, one night this happened. It woke me. I couldn't go back to sleep naturally. So I went into the computer and I began researching. I ran across um, shadow people, the old hag, um, what was known about them. I read all night long, listened to Chris White talk about sleep paralysis. And oh, wow, well, yeah, he's, he's really good. Oh, yeah, yeah, he helped me a lot. And so as the sun was coming up, I was tired because I'd been up all night. And I went out into the living room. I sank, sank into the easy chair and put my head back. And a voice, <laughs> clear as a bell, in my right ear says to me, it sounded like a male voice too, says to me, do you really think you can win? <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy, I'm in trouble, mm -hmm. you know. Um, at that point, I started taking it very seriously, and uh, I knew that this was, you know, nobody talks about hell. Nobody wants to talk about the reality of hell. Jesus talked mm -hmm. about it a lot. Nobody wants to, you know, I've heard so many times that he came, he sacrificed himself, he hung on the cross, he submitted to all of that torture because he's a good guy. And he wanted to reconcile us back to God. Well, while that's all true too, I think he did it to keep us out of hell and give us a way out. Because, you know, that's where I was headed. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, I, I think that I was so much in the devil's camp uh, now that I look back. How many of the Ten Commandments had I broken? You know, I tell myself, oh, in my heart, I'm such a good person. Phooey! <laughs> you know, actions speak louder than words. I mean, I had, I had broken every single commandment, if I wanted to be honest with myself. Um, and then people's minds always jump to the murder. Well, I'd had abortions. I mean, that had been my almost my method of um, contraception back in the early 70s, mid-70s. You know, I'm really ashamed to say it, but at the time, that was the option that I chose, and I didn't think anything of it. Um, so, yeah, I began attending church. I began reading the Bible. I mean, for the first time in my life, 
if I get into the New Testament, and it, it amazes me. You know, I got a version that I could understand. It didn't have so many these and thous in it. And I, I begin to, to read the words uh, that I'd heard these things all throughout my... I didn't know they came from Jesus. Who knew, who knew Jesus said these things? I didn't. But now that I'm reading the Bible... I become to know, I began to know um, I began to know him and uh, he was not disappointing to me at all. Mm-hmm. I, I want to say too that I don't have that I knew about I didn't really have any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I don't speak in tongues. I thought I had some discernment. Um, who knows of about that, but that he has spoken to me a number of times, and I have known that it's been him. Um, because you don't have the gift of tongues mm-hmm. yet, Kim. Yet, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, no. Just, I uh, want... Sorry to interrupt, we've just got five minutes to go just to let you know. Okay, well, I want to tell you what the fruit of it has been then. Um, mm-hmm. I asked the Lord what he wanted me to do and in a dream well it wasn't a dream I woke up in the morning mouthing the word supplication now this is a word that I didn't know and I wasn't sure and I didn't know the meaning of Mm -hmm. so I wasn't sure if it came from him because at the time I was studying a lot of um, pharmaceutical terms so I didn't do anything about it. But the second morning, I was woke up again, mouthing the word supplication. And I realized then that, you know, that sent me to the dictionary. And it had one meaning and only one meaning, which was heartfelt prayer. And I knew that that had come from him. Um, another time, he said to me over and over at night, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And that wasn't um, a biblical, that wasn't a scripture that I I remembered. So I feel that that came from him. And then the last yeah. thing, and this is important for people, or at least it was important for me. I had been an alcoholic who had been sober, who had been sober 12 years when I relapsed. But when I relapsed, I didn't fall hard. Now I could drink in a very controlled way. I liked my big chilled glass of wine after work every day, but I didn't have to have two or three. The problem was that as time went by, it became more and more important, and I began to wonder if it was an idol. Because I knew that I would go out into a snowstorm to buy this wine, but I wouldn't go out into a snowstorm for anything else. So I asked the Lord, sent me to the Bible. I found a, a spot in the Old Testament about the tribe that was invited to... Um, the temple for a feast and wine, and they declined the wine because they promised their father in exchange for his blessing they wouldn't drink wine. And God had responded in, in the Old Testament, they do their father's will, therefore they have my blessing too. So that wasn't good enough for me though, Laura, because I really liked my wine, right? And I, I said, Lord, I need you to answer this specifically. Is it a sin? Tell me. I mm-hmm. I want to hear it from you, because if it is, I'm giving it up. And the Lord answered me in one word, and I've never forgotten it. It was recidivism. That was the word he used to answer me. And again, it sent me to the dictionary. Uh, Recidivism is when, you know, uh, a prisoner is uh, given an early release, and he goes out and he reoffends and is sent back to prison. That's called the recidivism rate. Mm-hmm. And and, um, and I could see that this this was had the potential all the potential of sending me back to where I'd been and so yeah. I haven't had a drink since and I continue to try to live obediently so um, oh I don't know do we have one minute left. A couple of minutes left, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is really so interesting and, and so common. Um, you know that, that many folks, they have been affected by the demonic, whether it's the alcoholism or 
new age or whatever else. And you have since you told me uh, got interested in the deliverance ministry right. um, because you're aware of that. So uh, yeah, j just kind of a conclude now, and then I'll ask you to pray for the listeners. I just want to say that the Lord did something for me that others need to know about too. He sent someone with the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we always test these things. We don't take them at face value. But a woman mm -hmm. approached me, and she identified herself as, this is a stranger to me. She had the gift of prophecy. And then she set down the rules. She says, if anything I tell you is not biblical, you ignore it. Everything I'm about to tell you is rooted in the Bible. And she said to me, you know, the Lord wants you to know he loves you so much. But here's the thing. When he sets you free, he intends you to be free. He doesn't like it when you hold on to shame. When he forgives, he also forgets. And he wants you to know that you are to let it go. Stop beating yourself up. Uh, his intention is to set you free. He, he wants you to um, accept this. He wants you to have faith. He wants you to trust in him. He's going to see to your needs. And that's what you need to do. And I was so grateful for that message because the truth of it is that when we come to Christ, there's still that, how do you forgive yourself, you know? And, yeah. and that has helped me because I always go back to that. I want to be obedient. This is what he wants from me, and this is what I'm going to do. I've forgiven others, you know, which isn't easy, right? Yeah. But forgiving yourself, I mean, that's even harder. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what I want to leave people with. Um, the peace comes if you, if you follow the directions. The peace comes. Don't try to do it yourself. Don't let it be a faith of your own creation. You don't know what you're doing. I didn't. You know, fall back on the word of the Lord. Our ancestors got it right. They, Grandma knew. <laughs> so, yeah. That's beautiful, Kim. You know, thank you so much for sharing. Um, it was really so good to have you on the show. Could you please pray for the listeners now in closing? Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to share what you have done for me with others who are suffering who are lost they can't hear you they can't see you they can't feel you yet but they will and Lord um, I pray that you will take those blinders off that they will seek salvation from you and that all of the fruit of the spirit will come to them and they will see how worthwhile Um, how much joy, the, the, the peace, the, it clears up all confusion. And uh, you are truly the way. And I just pray for all the people who listen, who don't know that yet, that they will keep seeking. And that our testimony and Laura's work will help them along their way. And I come to you faithfully in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Kim. God bless you. God bless the listeners. And we look forward to talking to you again really soon. The views expressed in this production may not necessarily be those of Eternal Radio. Eternal Radio.